It's a pleasure to be here. Actually, I didn't expect so many people to come out on a Tuesday morning. Uh, and uh, and I, I, I feel the same as, as, as you uh, mentioned in your introduction. It is very hard after having had a nice weekend, being together with family, uh, to talk about a topic like this. But quite frankly, I have been researching this and working in this field for now 30 years. And uh, at a certain point, I think it has to become, not normal, but it has to become, uh, and not routine, but it has to become something that you can do analytically without, um, without being shocked every single time. I'm not going to show you, because I, I personally don't like to show uh, photographs of massacres and, and mass violence. I think we, we get enough of this on television. And uh, there is a sort of a, a sense of, uh, I detect in my students often a sense of, I don't want to say cold heartedness, but there's a sort of a numbing effect. If you see too many of those photographs, uh, I think you become, you close yourself. And uh, so I, I, I like to not to show these photos. I will, however, uh, I made an exception for you. This is the first time that I'm using some photographs. And this is because some of my doctoral students, they said, you know, you're wrong. You need to show photos. You need to show photos to show people what's going on. This is why we have that photography. And I said, I don't like that. I don't like this idea at all. And they said, well, why don't you try it? So. <laughs> I want to do three things this morning. Briefly talk about genocide, the term and the implications. And the main part, the second part, talk about the explanations that we have for mass murder, and I'm going to draw on different disciplines, not just history. Historians actually, I, and I can say this because I'm also a political scientist, historians are not very good at dealing with this phenomenon. In fact, uh, most of the literature comes from anthropology, sociology, law, poli-sci, political science, but not from history. But that's going to change once my book is done. <laughs> and in a third section, um, I will uh, briefly talk about what happens to societies after genocide um, and what happens to us after genocide. So let's start with what's in a word. Catherine already uh, said a few things here. I think important for us to remember is that mass violence is a constant in human history. Uh, and that holds true for pre-modern and modern history. Think of uh, Sparta, Carthage, Tamerlane, the Crusades, the conquest of the Americas. It's all full of mass violence. In modern times, this mass violence has accelerated. Uh, the reason why that is is obviously because of technological quantum leaps, modern warfare, the formation and of nation states, environmental destruction, hunger, social injustice. All of this attests to the civilization that we have constructed on the, on the negative side. I mean, there are many positive things about society that, uh, and our civilization that we could mention and that we enjoy. I think you know, one of the greatest technological inventions is the dishwasher. Every time, every time, and yesterday I did this again, every time I feel it, I say, hallelujah. Thank you. I don't know who built this thing. I don't know who came up with it. But it's a great testimony to our civilization. 
but there are downsides. And these downsides are uh, the persistence of uh, mass violence. All you have to do is look to Syria. All you have to do is look to ISIS or ISIL or whatever they want to call this organization. All you have to do is uh, look to uh, the persistence of environmental destruction and hunger. Now, genocide is a particular form of human mass violence. We estimate today that about 200 million adults and children were killed in genocides over the last century alone. Some of the better known cases are the Armenian genocide, the Shoah, or often referred to as the Holocaust, the destruction of ethno-cultural minorities during the regimes of Stalin and Mao, the genocides in Indonesia, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Guatemala, Bosnia, Rwanda, and Sudan. This is not a definite list, but just a, a sort of a, a list of the cases that are often uh, referred to. They're less disputed because definitions are important to what we're doing here. And even though this is not a law class, Catherine, you didn't say that one of my, one of the fields that I studied was constitutional law. So I have a, I have a liking for law. So you're going to hear something about law. And law is important in this case because genocide is, as a form of mass violence, very much dependent on precise definitions. All right. The person who coined the term, as you said, was Raphael Lemkin. Lemkin was a, um, a Polish uh, Jewish legal scholar. Uh, he only lived 59 years. When he died, he died in, uh, he was a difficult man. Um, I've read some letter exchanges between Lemkin and other people. A lot of people didn't like him uh, because he was so persistent. Do you know like when people like when they only have one topic to talk about? Oh, Jesus. It's like you're at a, you're at a reception or at a party. I, what I, for example, can't, I don't, I can't stand when people come so close to you and you back all the time. And they, they keep following you. <laughs> it's just like, you know, turn around and just say, like, please, keep some distance. Lemkin, he had no intellectual distance. He had one topic and one topic only for 30 years. When he died, there were apparently only six or seven people at his funeral. We could go to downtown London and we could ask. He's one of the greatest thinkers, I would say, mass violence in the 20th century. And if we were to go down to the market and we would ask, who coined the, phrase, who coined the term genocide? How many people do you think would know? Well, Raphael Lemkin coined it. And as you said, he, it's an artificial term. He used Latin and Greek uh, and uh, put it uh, together from genos, race, or nation, and seed, killing, and then came up with this term. He wrote it in 1944 in a book about the, about the Nazi occupation of uh, Europe, and he was looking for a term that would describe this new quality of violence. He had in the 20s already fought for an international convention after the Armenian genocide uh, <clears throat> on that topic, but with a little success. He has a fabulous uh, life story. If you ever want to read something about uh, an, interesting, uh, an interesting life, his is an interesting life. It is a sad life in a way. He lost most of his family. They were killed in various concentration camps. He fled uh, through from Poland, through Russia, with the Trans-Siberian Railroad into Mongolia, China, Japan, and finally ended up in the United States. 
where he had a hard time making a living uh, because he was a lawyer, but he was trained in Polish law, and that wasn't much help in the United States. So he, he, uh, he died penniless. But before he died, he witnessed something spectacular, really, I think. Uh, and that, oh, by the way, this is how he looks like. Uh, he, uh, he was able, with uh, a couple of other people, to help bring about the UN Convention uh, on Genocide. The exact title of this document is uh, unwieldy, UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. <gasps> It was adopted by the General Assembly in 1948 and came into force 1951. Not every country has uh, signed this. I think the last one was San Marino, if you know what that is or where it is. Um, and there are 144 countries that have signed it so far, I think. So not every. Canada ratified it in 1952, the Soviet Union in 1954, the People's Republic of China in 1983, and hold on to your seats, the United States in 1988. On peut tard, huh? That's a little bit late, but at least better late than never. The reasons for the delays in, in accepting this and incorporating this uh, a piece of law uh, is, of course, that there are ethical and political implications. Because if once you accept this document, um, you're, you're subscribing to a specific view of what constitutes this crime. And I'm not going to, uh, there are 19 articles, so no worries, we're not going to look at 19 articles. I just want to uh, point uh, out to you in four articles a few of the highlights. So when you look at Article 1, it says there that the contracting parties confirm that genocide, whether committed in time of peace or in time of war, is a crime which they're going to punish. Now, this is important because up to that time, and up, you know, the Nuremberg trial and everything, it was considered that crime was, this crime was sort of a, an outflow of war, right? Bad things happen in war, so uh, this form of mass violence, people said, well, would happen in war. Here it says, doesn't matter if it's time of peace or time of war, it has to be punished. Now, Article 2, this is, of course, the most contentious one, because it tries to define what genocide is. It says that the following acts committed with intent to destroy. Well, here where we have the first problem. How do you prove an intent to destroy? In whole or in part, that's the next difficulty, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such, and then the various ways this can be done, like killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent birth within the group, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Now, if you want to take that last section there, forcibly transferring children, what does that, what do you, what do you, what, what does that evoke in you? Or what are you, say what? Residential, Residential schools, for example. But not only uh, Canadian residential schools, it would be off-reservation boarding schools in the United States, it would be uh, schooling programs in Australia, you know, the, 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 the stolen generation, Irish, uh, 
And now, of course, uh, we can argue that this ISIS group uh, is obviously guilty of this as well, because uh, I read this morning, and you probably did too in the Globe, that uh, they are, are, are capturing girls and, and children and selling them. So forcibly transferring them from one group to another. Now, Article 3 says that what should be punished in this case? Well, what should be punished, I think is fairly clear, is the genocide itself. But not only that, there is a conspiracy to commit genocide. There is an incitement, this is Article 3C, to commit genocide. There is the attempt, it doesn't always have to be successful, quote unquote. There couldn't be an attempt as well. And finally, complicity in genocide. For me, the, uh, one of the most interesting things is Article 4, because Article 4 says that it doesn't matter if it's a government or if it's a private person. Uh, constitutionally responsible rulers, public officials, or private individuals. So, for example, in Nigeria right now, you have a group called Boko Haram. Uh, they're a fundamentalist Islamic group connected somehow to Al-Qaeda, and, and they target specifically Christians. So they bomb Christian churches and uh, commit massacres among Christians. All right, so uh, this is not a government organization. It's a private group. But if we go back to Article uh, Article uh, 2, we see that they are targeting a religious group, so in this case, Christians. And Article 4, they are private individuals. So their goal is to kill all Christians in Nigeria. So this group is committing genocide. Now, these things are, you might think that they are dull and dry, just as dull and dry when you go to the notary and have something drawn up there, uh, but they're not. This is drama. Because everything circles around this. In the United, in the UN, and I don't know if you've ever been to the building, uh, 57s, uh, and, and you know, if you go there, and you, you, or if you haven't been, but you go to New York, take a tour of the Security Council, take a look at how it looks like there. Very interesting. These, they have these terribly old chairs. They're so uncomfortable. They're like from the 50s, and you're like, I don't know if people were smaller then, but for somebody who's six, seven, they're tiny. So I couldn't sit there. Terribly small. This is decisive. As soon as all these parameters are fulfilled, the countries who subscribe to this legal framework have a duty and an obligation to call it what it is, to call it genocide. And that obliges those countries to become active. That's why a lot of countries try to wiggle their way around it. They call it acts of genocide or use an adjective, genocidal, seemingly genocidal, right? The United States has a, a particularly uh, unfortunate role to play uh, in the Rwanda case. The Rwanda case is a prime case where you can study how countries try to get around calling it what it is, genocide. The shortcomings of this convention are that it excludes political or social groups. So you know, for example, that Canada recognizes the uh, Ukrainian famine as a genocide. There are only seven countries who do so. And the reason why that is is because the Ukrainian famine uh, does not fulfill all the requirements of the genocide definition because the people who were targeted there were either a political or a social group. So for example, if you say, I'm going to kill uh, 
I'm going to kill all peasants in my country, or I'm going to kill a third of the peasants of my country because I think they're politically unwieldy and unruly, that is obviously, that's not covered under this convention. And that's a shortcoming. The Soviet Union objected to including political or social groups when this was drawn up. So that's a problem. There's also no talk of cultural destruction. I mean, wouldn't you say that the destruction of your culture and everything that belongs to it, your, the language, the things that you read, the music that you hear, the things that you eat, your names, everything, the erasure of libraries, university would be closed, your religion, all of this, isn't this, in fact, a, a killing as well? It's not a physical killing, but I'm taking away what makes us human beings, right? So cultural destruction, unfortunately, is not covered in this convention. The Danish representative, when this was drawn up, he must have been an idiot, he was asked about culture, and then he said, oh, well, Burning a library is not the same as killing a person. Wow. That maybe he should have looked at burning books is maybe the first step before people are killed. So there's an intimate connection between the attempt to erase a culture and to erase a people. The in whole or in part obviously is a problem as well. Um, by the way, if you want to study cultural destruction, Tibet is a great, a great case of, of looking at how a culture is systematically destroyed. And there's also a lack of reference uh, to states as perpetrators. All right, enough law. Let's talk about explanations for mass murder. I want to, uh, I'm going to talk about those aspects. So the dynamics of mass murder, motives, possible motives, who are the victims, who are the perpetrators, what are bystanders, and who were resistors. So the dynamics. Genocides don't happen from one day to the next across time and space. There are certain recurring themes and stages I'm using an eight-stage uh, systematic developed by Gregory Stanton. Um, he's a, an American diplomat and the president of Genocide Watch. And he, I think he has put this fairly well together. So he starts with classification. Classification is um, a process in societies, us versus them. These uh, classifications are done either by nationality, religion, ethnicity, and so on. Second, symbolization. Symbolization is you identify members of a group through symbols. So in this case, uh, people are marked and they receive a symbol. The yellow star is a fairly obvious example. Third, dehumanization. Well, propaganda in a society starts to talk about a specific group as less than human. Uh, hate propaganda, if you, if you look at uh, the Rwandan case again, or Nazi Germany, uh, or Cambodia, any case you want, you're going to see animal Im images. So in Rwanda, they talk about uh, you know, the group that was uh, to be killed as insects, as cockroaches, as you know, uh, something that was supposed to be uh, eliminated from the communal house of the nation, a pest. And there was always a danger in Nazi propaganda, you can see this very well, of contamination, of those who are not part of the group being contaminated. Four, organization. This is plans, training, logistics. So it's not like, don't imagine these genocides there. It's not like people get up and they say on Tuesday morning, okay, all right, today's the day, we're going to do it. No, 
And the Rwandan case, for example, eight months before the genocide, which started in April 1994, ships arrived, truckloads full of machetes, which people had, the, these paramilitaries had purchased in China. So all these machetes arrived, warehouses full of machetes. You can, if you read Romeo Dallaire's uh, book, you can, he talks about that. And then he went there and he said, what's with all these machetes? And they're saying, well, we're preparing for the harvest. <laughs> but you know, you know that the term harvest is the term they used in Rwanda for the killing. And they described their participation in the killing as going to work. So I've read many interviews, for example, with killers, and when you read them, they always talk about, we went to work at sunrise. We took a break from work for lunch. Polarization is, is the fifth step. That is trying to isolate the victims by prohibiting social interaction. The Nuremberg race laws are a typical example. So Jews in Germany are not allowed to do anything. It starts relatively harmless and then it gets more and more and more. 1939, I think there are about 400 regulations that prohibit every single aspect of life. All right, so you're not allowed to go to the park, you're not allowed to use a tram, you're not allowed to do this and this and that and that and that. So in the end, you're thinking like, what is this? And then finally, oh, and part of this polarization is also that there are always moderate forces, and these moderate forces have to be silenced. There are always good people, but these good people have to be shoved to the side. They have to be marginalized, and they have to be silenced for this to be successful. Finally, <clears throat> then there's the killing. And the last step is the denial. So evidence is destroyed, mass graves are, are covered up, are dug up, uh, bodies burned, witnesses are intimidated. Now, what makes people participate in this? This is probably the question. I mean, if I knew the answer to this question, uh, I don't know. What do you think? What do you what do you think? What do you think makes people do things like this? Do you have any I mean you must have thought about it during 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 your life when when this came up. Does anybody have any any idea? What was that? Hate? Okay, hate? Mob hysteria? Okay. Fear of difference. So you have thought about it from time to time. Was this a specific occasion? Was it that when you were looking at news of these massacres or things that you thought like, gosh, what makes people do things like this? Or is it crime, domestic crime? I mean, sometimes I look at statistics of crime and then when I'm at Love Laws and I'm standing and waiting in the cashier and then you're thinking like, oh, every seventh person, you know, has committed rape, for example. And then you're standing there and you think like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> well, think about it. Or, I mean, you, you, you would think that, oh yeah, this is relatively rare, right? But, well, in Rwanda, for example, the number of victims is about a million. The number of the killers is more than a quarter of a million. More than 250,000 people participated in the killing. So, what makes people do this? Well, one, I would say, and this, the things that you have said, I think they fall into these categories. One is that this is always about power and control. The state that we live in, the nation state that we live in, has not been around forever. It's only a couple of centuries old. And nation states are built on exclusion. 
They need to exclude others to make those who live in there happy that they're in. This morning on the front page, I threw the paper almost through the family room when I read this. The Globe and Mail is such, it's becoming such a bad paper. Uh, it's, I don't know what's the matter with these people. There's an article about temporary foreign workers and about somebody in Alberta in a mall who hires these people. And these temporary foreign workers are taking jobs away from indigenous people now. Now it even has another moral category to it. There has been a government campaign for months and months and months talking negatively about temporary foreign workers. This is an example of us and them. There is a campaign right now of altering the citizenship laws of being able to withdraw citizenship from people who have committed a crime. This is illegal. Your federal government, it's not mine because I'm not a citizen here, your federal government is violating international law. It is committing a crime. Do you know which country used to withdraw citizenship from people? Nazi Germany. If you committed a crime against the state in Germany, you and your family would lose citizenship. And with it, all the legal protection you had. That's why the United Nations invented something called the Nunzen Pass, which was then, after the war, given to people who had lost their citizenship. These things are very dangerous, and you've got to watch where this is leading. But these are just some examples of how we separate those in and those out. Another important element is bureaucracy. Bureaucracies control our life, they control yours, they control mine, they keep you busy with filling out forms and applications and documentations and could you please Xerox this and bring that and that and you have to run from here to there. And it's gotten a little bit better with the digital, digital availability of things but it is, still, um, it is still pretty much an instrument of keeping you busy. Bureaucracies regulate everything. Bureaucracies are a result of the modern age. They were created to make nation states more efficient, historically. And they have done that. There are great, I mean, bureaucracies are great institutions. At the same time, they also are institutions which are absolutely essential in upkeeping this difference between us and them. In every single genocide that you can study in history, bureaucracy plays a fundamental and central role. No genocide in modern history could be executed without bureaucracy. If it's the J in your passport saying that you're Jewish, or it's the T or the H in Rwanda saying that you're Hutu or Tutsi, if it's the list drawn up, if it's the registries, the birth certificates, the this, the that, without bureaucracy, there is no genocide. Now, I'm not saying we should get rid of bureaucracy, and that's an illusion anyway. But you have to remember that ordering people and controlling them through paperwork is an instrument of power. Bureaucracies execute the nation state's power. There's also greed. I have a project uh, that explores this, as you said, Catherine, and I look at econo economic motives for killing. Over the years, it, you know, I, I saw it, the talk of racism and the talk of this and that uh, became a little bit, <sighs> I have difficulties believing that somebody could be so uh, driven by racism, for example, that a person would go out and kill somebody else. I just can't believe it. I mean, I find that very hard to believe that ideology could bring you to kill your neighbors. I mean, but this is the explanation that we're usually given, right? It's a mix of race, ideology, and this and that. 
What I found more interesting is that in every single case, and I can, from personal observation in Bosnia and in Congo, I can, I can tell you that uh, in every single case, money plays a role. And if it's not money, it's personal advancement. In Congo, in the refugee camp, for example, if you wanted to identify killers from Rwanda, all you had to do is was look around and see if you saw people with sheet metal, because this is what they stole. Metal roofs in Rwanda were a sign of wealth, and the killers had nothing better to do than to strip the homes of the ones that they killed and take it with them as they had to leave Rwanda and fled to Congo. In Germany, the people who were deported, they had to sell everything. If they wanted to leave, they had to sell everything. If you were a Jew, let's say, living in Paris in 1942, and you would get the letter saying, you have to be tomorrow morning at the Gare du Nord, and you're going to be transported for work. This is what they used to tell people. Please purchase your SNCF ticket at the train station. The Jews in Holland, in the Czech Republic, or Czechoslovakia as it was then called, and France had to pay for their own ticket to Auschwitz. In 1938, when the synagogues were burned and the um, businesses ransacked, the insurance companies in Germany refused to pay the damage, which at this point was something like $400 million. In fact, they increased the insurance premiums. When people died uh, in in um, Guatemala, for example, when they were killed, their land was appropriated by wealthy landowners. And there are many, many more examples. Professional advancement and economic profit are inseparably linked to mass murder. And people don't like to talk about it because maybe they think that it, it devalues the victims or it sort of takes something away from the victims. The other possibility, they don't want to talk about it because there's a little bit of greed in all of us, or well, certainly in me. I, like when I go to the superstore, I bring all the coupons with me that I can get. <laughs> I study everything, and if the orange juice is 450 instead of seven bucks, well, I'll, of course I buy it. Would I go and take it from my neighbor? Probably not. Well, let's hope not. But because this economic incentive is in all of us, I think people don't like to talk about it. But it needs to be explored, and there's virtually nothing on it. So uh, in a few years, there will be. Finally, there is, of course, religion, utopias, and ideologies that people have died for. You know all of these cases. I don't need to reiterate it. Uh, from the Crusades to the Islamic State today to um, to uh, the ideologies, fascism, communism, uh, they have, and then of course the utopias, because utopias have at their core a disregard for individuality. They assume we're all the same. We're all the same, we all want the same, uh, we all need the same, but we're not the same. We're all different, we all have different needs. And simply to say, uh, you know, this is the way we're going to live, it's not going to work. Finally, there are personal motives. There are people who are, uh, they enjoy participation in these things. I mean, there's no, uh, I don't think there's anything, this is something that you probably know. Not everybody who commits a crime needs accommodation. 
Okay, let me be very clear on this. I, this is a, something that is becoming very profuse in the society, is that everybody who does something, need, that we need an explanation. Oh, Bobby had a, oh, Bobby had a hard childhood. Oh, yeah, he had it so difficult. Well, sorry he slaughtered his neighbors. Oh, we're feeling so sorry. No, quite frankly, I disagree with that. Personal motives are, they are rare, I would say, but they are there. There are people who enjoy killing. Let's face it. They like, they like standing at a ramp and selecting between life and death. They're on a power trip. This is great. How much better can it get? Read interviews with killers and you know what I'm talking about. They're rare. Not, maybe not so rare, but they're there. Now, if you want to talk about the people that are part of this, the first people we have to talk about are the victims, I think. But I found it so hard over the years to find out what connects them. It, there is seemingly nothing that connects them. This is... This is a, a photograph that you've probably seen before, and if you haven't, well, then you're seeing it now. It's a one of 15,000, it's one section of 14 and a half, 15,000 photographs that were taken in one prison, it's called S21, which it's a former high school in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. And they used to take photographs of every prisoner there are only, I think it's seven, six or seven known survivors of people who went through this prison. Um, and, whoops, and there are children, right? children, women, men, old, young, as you can see. Usually they took a photograph of the person before they killed them. Now, the 200 million people who were who were killed over the last century, uh, their lives can't be reduced to neat categories because they're all, they're all individuals. And they can't be reduced to the neat categories that the UN Convention demands. The problem is, is that in every single case, we're dealing with multitudes. So, for example, when we take Cambodia, we're not just talking about one specific group, let's say Vietnamese. We're also talking about Buddhist monks. We're also talking about ethnic groups that, that you and I probably have never heard of. When we look at Pakistan or Bangladesh, we're looking at a wide variety of, uh, of groups uh, who were victimized. In Guatemala, Mayas, even though they constitute the majority of the country, were victimized. They were killed by 250,000 by the Guatemalan military. In Germany, you're not just dealing with Jews who were killed, but it's the Roma, it's the Zinti, it's the priests, it's the... Uh, it's, uh, um, alternative sexual orientation, it's Christian scientists, it's Poles, it's Russians, it's, it's a very, it's a wide variety of people who are victims in those genocides. And that makes it so hard to talk about what connects them. And it makes it also hard to predict who could be a victim. This photograph, I don't know if you've seen it, it's from an album uh, that was discovered a number of years ago. I use this photograph because it runs probably against the common stereotype of how a killer looks like. These girls are in their early 20s and they are SS guards. These are um, you know, nice uh, young girls eating blueberries um, on a weekend, 1944, uh, in a sanatorium, like a resort outside of Auschwitz. And 
So when you look at that, you're thinking, hmm, well, I always assumed that killing was only done by men. Well, not so. In Auschwitz, there were about 5,000 women working as prison guards. Some of these are, uh, have, been or have been prosecuted in, in trials. Um, the reason why a lot of these girls worked there is not because they were sadistically inclined or because they were mean, but because they were professionals. They worked in the civil service and as corrections officers, and as women at the time, they, were, they could not get promotions or higher pay uh, in contrast to their male uh, corrections officers. The only way for them to professionally advance was service in a concentration camp. And this is why 5,000 of them, for example, chose to work in Birkenau and in Auschwitz. These were the most sort of independent-minded young women. Now, when we talk about perpetrators, uh, there is a lot of research on perpetrators. There is very little systematic on victims, but a lot on perpetrators. Uh, mostly, I think that the explanations that you're going to find fall into two large, uh, two large groups, or in two large categories. One is a, a sort of a systematic category that sort of emphasizes structural forces rather than individual, and another one emphasizes individual uh, forces. Individual forces, uh, and there I, pro I mentioned to you the so-called Milgram experiment, which I'm sure that you, you, you have heard on occasion. This was a, uh, an experiment exploring obedience in people. It was done by Stanley Milgram, who was a, uh, a psychiatrist. He did it in the United States in the, in the 60s, 1960, in fact, at Yale. Um, and do, does, do, you, do, you, do you know what the Milgram experiment is? And I don't need to explain it. Or have you ever heard this? Or? No, no. Oh, okay. No. All right. So I'll, I'll let me say what it was. Uh, all male subjects in age ranging from the 20s to 50s with various professional backgrounds, from, you know, um, they were given a role as teacher or a learner in a learning situation. Uh, in which memory would be controlled. Both were separated, so the teacher and the learner were separated by a wall, and the teachers were told by a fake doctor in a, in a white lab coat that they had to shock the learner if that person didn't give the right answer. And the shock would be carried out with electricity. So for that, the teachers had a fake generator at their disposal to administer these shocks uh, in increments from 15 to 450 volts. The maximum was labeled on this, on this machine with a triple X. Now, with the progression of the experiment, the learners on the other side of the wall would plead, uh, they were actors. Right? But they would plead and say, oh, no, please don't shock me. I'm trying to remember what you told me. But, And then they would get painful shocks, and they would scream. And uh, it all sounded you know, very realistic. And uh, the interesting thing is that the outcome of the experiment was a complete surprise to all the psychiatrists who were involved. 62% of the test subjects continued to administer shocks to the bitter end, which is the perceived death of the uh, learners. Milgram, he wrote, quote, what is surprising is how far ordinary individuals will go in complying with the experimenter's instructions. It is the extreme willingness of adults to go to almost any length on the command of an authority that constitutes the chief finding of the study and the fact most urgently demanding explanation. Let's say something about bystanders. This summer I uh, um, 
when I was uh, in Amsterdam with my family, we went to, I wanted to show uh, the Anne Frank House to my daughter. I don't know if you've been to Amsterdam or you know, that you've been to the museum. Luckily, we had ordered the, car, the, the tickets before because there was a lineup uh, uh, for, for, for two blocks. Uh, I've, you know, my daughter, she's 13, and she's read uh, the Anne Frank diary, uh, uh, or one version of it. There are several versions of it. She's read it uh, four times now, and she really, I think, as a young girl, she, she sees a connection uh, between you know that girl and herself, um, and uh, and I saw this photograph. This is a very very rare photograph. I saw it in the exposition, and um, and I was speaking to the curator of the of the Anne Frank Foundation. Uh, about this, because this is very, very seldom that you have a photograph of an early morning deportation. This is what you're seeing here. And I, I, I can't get that, you can't get it bigger. I mean, what you can see is people on a gracht here in Amsterdam, They're, and they have luggage with them. They have these you know, uh, backpacks or whatever you want to call them. There are kids among them, and there's some soldiers you can see the helmets there. And they're on their way to uh, the uh, tram, which is going to take them to their meeting place. From there, they will go to Westerbork, which is the uh, Dutch uh, uh, intermediate camp. And from there, they will go to uh, the death camps, most likely uh, the children for sure. Uh, this is a photograph that was taken by a neighbor I don't know anything about the neighbor, and I don't know what happened to it. I know it was a man, but I don't know what happened to him or what he did. But he is a typical example of a bystander. Right? He didn't run out the door and say, wait a second, hold on, I know these kids. They're not Jewish. No, he didn't know. He, just, he took a photograph. Of course, you could say he's more than a bystander because he documented something. And I, we have to be grateful that we have that. As I said, there are very, very few of these pictures. Bystanders are, uh, they're characterized by uh, something that's called diffusion of responsibility. You probably know this. Uh, do you know this New York murder case, Kitty Genovese, who was killed? Do you, do you know this story? Where, where everybody thought that the, na the, the, the other was calling the cops. This is like a famous case. It's like, oh, something happens. You look out the window. You say, oh, my gosh. Huh? Well, I guess the neighbors are calling the police. OK, we don't have to bother. But in the Kitty Genovese case, the woman was killed by her husband, I think, uh, nobody called because everybody thought the other people were calling. Then there's also confusion. It's often unclear what's really going on. I mean, do you, do you understand what's going on in Syria? Well, I don't. Yeah, the broad outlines, we, we might. But all the details, names, places, things, we've never, we've never heard of. I mean, how, how, how can we? So we defer to experts, right? If experts say, yep, yeah, this is the way it is, uh, then everything is good. So if experts tell us, yep, these people are criminals, sorry, they have to be removed, well, who are we to argue? Pluralistic ignorance is something that uh, people often hide their emotions in public. So, I mean, you all know this, and I know this. You, you go somewhere, you're not sure how these people are. Are they friendly? Are they unfriendly? Hmm? Hmm. You hide your emotions and wait for a signal. You know, are, are these people receptive or are they not? If you cannot detect signs of concern, for example, then you will conclude there is no concern. And that's very common. I mean, we, we orient ourselves. When you hear the fire bell ring or something, you look around and see what, what are the other people? What are they doing? Do they look frightened? Or in an airplane, you're just being served your lunch and it, it becomes a bumpy ride, and you're thinking, oh my gosh, something is wrong. 
And then you look at the flight attendants, and they're humming and distributing the food. And, and then you're thinking like, well, if they're in, good, in a good mood, everything must be good. And then my daughter, she wanted me to put in fear, which I said, okay, I did I, last night. And I, I showed her the slides. And then she said, well, you've got to put in fear. And I said, why fear? And she said, well, because people are afraid. They're afraid of, of stepping forward and doing something. And I said, yeah, that's a good point. I didn't think about it. So I said, okay, fine, I'll put it in. So here it is, fear. And I think it's a very, it's a very valid point. We're afraid. I'm including myself there, often, because we're raised in a certain way. For example, respect authority, right? Would you go up to a, a policeman who's leading people away and say, hold on a second, my friend, these people aren't going anywhere. And I'd say like, okay, one more word and you're in trouble. And you're like, yeah, I give you that word. Give me the kids. And they're like, okay, you come with us. You know, that's, that's the argument that you often hear. Some people don't have that fear. But a lot of us do because we're socialized that way. We're raised in a certain way in schools. We're respecting authority. Uh, we're trained this way. And genocidal regimes make use of it. Now, there are luckily people who resist and who rescue. And I'll you know, give you some examples here. We have Oskar Schindler, whom you know, <laughs> a couple of years ago. My daughter, she goes to Ryerson Public uh, Elementary School, and she had to write an essay on, it's an Old North here, and she had to write an essay on heroes. And then she told me, she said, well, I've seen these things on your desk. There was a book about Oskar Schindler, and she said, uh, was he a good man? And I said, well, I don't, I don't know. I, you know I, so what did he do? And I said, well, he did this and this and this, and he had this list, and he has this factory, and there are like a thousand names on it. He saved a lot of people, eh, and I made a movie about it, and da 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 Ha! Huh. And she said, well, I'm going to use him as an example. Okay, so I gave her stuff to read, and that wasn't what she had expected, because Oskar Schindler was... He was a Nazi. He, he drank heavily with Nazis. Every Thursday, he used to sit around with the SS and get drunk. He was a womanizer. He gambled. Money meant nothing to him. You know, he smoked, I don't know, 20 cigars per day. He was a sort of a rough guy. So my daughter came back to me and she said, hmm. Well, I said, so what do you think? Well, he was a womanizer. <laughs> and, well, she said, I think I'll title it Oskar Schindler, an ambivalent hero. <laughs> and I said, you know what? You're a smart kid. Because this is really, this is really what it is. It's about ambivalence. It's not these people are not holy. Hui Serene, he's a, a Cambodian who, uh, who saved uh, a dozen families. This uh, woman here is an interesting girl, Zula Karahimbi. She's from Rwanda, uh, very, very poor, lived on the outskirts of a small town in a shack, and had supposedly magical powers. So when the genocidaires came to her house, she said, oh, you can't come in. I'll put a spell on you. They all ran away. And then they talked about it and they said, well, this woman is so poor. How could she possibly hide somebody? Well, she, had, she saved more than 20 people. And she had no food or nothing. Everything away. She's 70, I think she's 78 now. It's a fabulous case. Uh, then we have this guy. The, the man on the left, Paul Kreber, he was a police officer, a detective. In the, he was charged with organizing the deportation of Roma. They used to be called gypsies, but they're called Roma and Zinti. These are the two ethnic, ethnic cultural groups from a city in Germany, Wuppertal. And when he was going through the list, he said, wait a second, I know these people. 
there was a family of six. They were his neighbors. It's like, what the, what the heck are they doing on the list? I didn't know they're gypsies, they're Roma. My daughter and, and their daughter, they go and learn the violin together. Huh. And he said, well, they're going to die. And he took them off the list. He just took the list, he retyped it, and their names were off. And they survived the war. And he didn't tell anybody about it. But shortly before his death, this family came and said, you know, this guy should be recognized because he did something good. And this is how the story came out. Do you know this woman? Me Peace, she was the, she's the one, thanks to her, we have the, the diary of Anne Frank. She, uh, she was part of the, uh, the group of people who organized the hiding of, of Anne and, uh, Anna and her, her family. By the way, do you know what, uh, going back to greed and economics, do you know the first question that the police officer asked once, do you know that they were betrayed, Anna Frank and her family, and the, as they were betrayed by somebody, it's not clear by whom. In any case, an informant gave a tip to the police, the police came, the Dutch police came, and said, oh, you're, you're under arrest. The first question that a detective asked Anne Frank's father, was where are the valuables? And he said, and he went to a, a, a box that they had and gave the detective an envelope. And the detective said, no, where are the valuables? So the person who betrayed them received one week's of pay for that deed. And so apropos interest in money and valuables. Well, Meep was the one who found of the, uh, she found the, the diary and she kept it. And after, after the war, she gave it to Anne's dad. Um, and that's why we have it. Some rescuers are recognized. Uh, this is uh, in Israel, the uh, Garden of the Righteous Among the Nations. Uh, there's a whole, uh, you know, a whole process that uh, goes with this. Now, I need to ask Catherine, when do I need to stop talking? About 10 minutes ago? Oh my gosh. All right, uh, yes. Okay, so I don't want to, uh, just let me say, let, let me, maybe this is a good point to, maybe this is a good point to end as I don't want to, uh, um, okay, prevent us from having coffee and in particular prevent us from, from, from talking a little bit here. Uh, I just wanna say something about memory. There are many, many more aspects that I, I could talk about and we could spend weeks and weeks and weeks talking about this topic and I try to do it in a way that we don't come out all depressed and feel miserable for the rest of the week. And the reason why I think you shouldn't feel miserable is because we're doing, what we're doing here this morning, I think it's the most important thing that we can do. There are legal measures, there are discussions of intervention, military interventions is always an issue, peacekeeping and the like, and there are many aspects we could talk about. But I think that the most important weapon that we have in trying to control genocides, and, and I'm not illusionary, there will always be genocides. Let's face this, this is not going to go away. But what we can do is we can use the tools that we have to make it more unlikely that they happen. And I think the reason, and I think the fundamental, the fundamental element here is education, and it's educating about alternatives. So that's why I think talking about resistors and talking about people who helped people in genocide is one of the most important things. 
because it shows you that there is an alternative. Many people will say after a genocide, we didn't have a chance. We, if, if, if we would have done something, we would have been killed. I could give you many examples of cases where people were tasked with execution, for example. They were part of an execution uh, squad, and they refused. And nothing happened to them. Nothing. I could give you examples of people who were tasked with uh, shooting civilians and their commanding officer gave them an option and said, if you can't, if you can't do it, then don't, step to the side. And they did. There are always, and this is the point I'm trying to make, there are always alternatives. Yes, there is violence, there is the fear of being killed, there is, um, you know, the danger of being hurt, but, <clears throat> but there are alternatives. And I think uh, the task of education is to explore those alternatives and communicate them as widely and as clearly as we can. So before more people leave, <laughs> I stop. Thank you for your attention.